I'm going to start off. Um, well, my first two questions will be directed towards Ina. Now that wards of court uh, are due to be disbanded following the commencement of the Act, what process will be in place to support relevant persons? And what type of structure supports uh, will replace wards of court? Okay. Ina. And that's as and when required, which has always been true in wardship, that it's a last resort when you have hit a bump in the road when a decision needs to be taken and there's no way of achieving that other than by way of an application for wardship. Um, I think the presentation, obviously the associated materials that are referred, referred you to, do uh, reference the different tiers of support which may be appropriate and I hope the takeaway from today is don't think how do I now position people into this new grid of supports. Um, the, uh, there are a few questions around wardship, so I might try and deal with a couple of them in, yeah. in one go here. Um, there will be no new applications for wardship post the 26th of April. The Office of the Wards of Court won't be receiving those. An application for wardship that has been commenced and is ongoing pre the 26th of April may continue uh, and orders uh, may be made admitting a person to wardship and somebody who is currently a ward of court, the Office of the Wards of Court and the court will still have responsibilities there and will continue to make orders in wardship. Every current adult ward of court is coming out of wardship, that's to happen within three years. Uh, that applies to adults and as, as people turn 18 and age out then they'll become part of that process as well. So um, the Office of the Wards of Court and the Wardship Court is your source of information there. If you can't find who you need to speak to or access the information, come to us in the Decision Support Service or indeed Quiva's team will point you in the right direction. Um, and then the supports that are that, that new framework of supports, but before you get into the formalities of that, it's the, the essentials of the guiding principles as well, supporting people as far as possible to make their own decisions, acting in good faith and for their benefit, um, having regard to their will and preferences. All of that stuff takes you quite the distance before you need to worry about the formalities, and I think that Sean has spelled a lot of that out. Um, so I hope that addresses that, Jerry. Okay, yeah, I think you've addressed a couple of questions. Um, and, and sorry, but the next one is, yeah. um, will former um, committees have the opportunity? Yes, yes they will. They will if that's appropriate. Um, and um, it's envisaged under the Act that the person close to the, the relevant person will be ideally placed in that relationship of trust to step into one of the formal roles, if required. Thank you very much, Anthony. My next question, um, I'll direct towards Sean. Um, in relation to functional capacity assessments, if relevant person or their support representative is not in agreement with outcome of capacity assessment, is there room for appeal? Thank you. Yes, but, but just to think it through, first of all, uh, the support representative not in agreement with outcome, the support representative won't be appointed unless you know the capacity assessment leads to a capacity declaration. And I can't see this issue arising with the co decision maker because that is the person appointing the co decision maker themselves in general. Uh, so it might occur in terms of a, a DMRO, and there will be a route for people to appeal and disagree. And of course, people may, and it's another question there, may refuse to undergo an assessment as well because their consent is sought prior to capacity assessment. Again, that really can't be an issue with a co decision making agreement or with enduring power of attorney, because there, if the person doesn't want them, then they won't happen and can't happen. So that could potentially occur in terms of a, a decision-making representation order, at which stage on is the codes of practice from the DSS will explain the procedure to be followed, but it might ultimately lead to an application to court in some circumstances. But yes, we will explain to people, uh, as a matter of right, the outcome of any assessment of capacity done and inform them of a, a process for appeal if required. Thank you. Sean, you have anything to add on that? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, as Sean has said, in terms of the, um, you know, uh, it's only when, uh, um, I suppose, the awareness function capacity assessment will only be considered uh, when all other options to build capacity of relevant persons are explored. And there are concerns. What happens if the assessment of capacity is recommended for a relevant person, for example, capacity to make finances, uh, uh, and relevant person refuses to engage in the assessment? 
Okay, well, well, if they refuse, they refuse. You're certainly, there's no way of a forcible assessment of capacity is envisaged there. It, it, it depends on what you're intending to do. So if the plan is to seek to have a cold decision-making agreement, I think you have strong grounds for trying to persuade somebody because the whole goal of putting a support in place is to say this isn't about overriding what you want. It's to try and ensure that what you want occurs. And it's, it actually is a very good idea for you if it may be in question in some circumstances to go along with the capacity assessment because otherwise the cold decision-making agreement can't be made and you lose out in that way. It may be different, I think there will be issues if the intention is for a decision-making representation order to try and in some way not give effect to the will and preference of the person. Or I think we will get people saying, you mean the outcome of this assessment may be somebody will be appointed to make a decision on my behalf, which isn't consistent with my will and preference. The point there is they, they still have the right to refuse that assessment and you will have to go through codes, I think, to see whether or not there is grounds for going to court with a report that isn't based on a capacity assessment and the court can then make a declaration regarding capacity. Uh, so I think it may be an issue in a small court of cases, but it shouldn't be for co decision making agreements. Tina Brenton, just any experience in this area from your perspective? Um, I would say that that would be a common occurrence really as well as some of the work that we do and again we support and assist people as much as possible to, to build their capacity, encourage them and even sometimes look at the notion of maybe uh, if they had somebody that they trust and have good relationships to assist them with, with managing their finances and it trust was the, well, the least uh, intrusive intervention is what we'd be encouraging to support people and, and in some cases that works quite well, that would be all my experience anyway. Uh, no, no, the same really, just that um, very often it's not it's not that the person needs the, it's that, that the people working with them feel they need assurances around their, their decision making. And I think this is what changes now. We need to get more comfortable with people making all sorts of crazy decisions like we would make on a daily basis. So that's what's going to be the toughest bit for staff, I think. Um, but it's it's great to see this coming on board because it actually gives us a safety net in terms of sitting in that space. Um, so yeah, interesting times ahead. Can I just add there, uh, not too crazy, Tina. <laughs> to <the extent> of, <laughs> uh, no, to the extent of an unwise decision doesn't mean you lack capacity. It isn't necessarily a trigger for a capacity assessment, but there are all gradations within there. So there might be decisions that are so at variance with who they're known to be or that involves such a degree of serious risk that it may be required. But many of us, we decide to go skiing, even though it may result in a fracture, we decide to buy something that may be unwise or costs a bit too much. You know, so within the, it's within the variation there. Uh, <coughs> but it's just not a single unwise, but there, there, may be, there may be some that would raise questions. Thank you. For example, something that would be uh, criminal? <laughs> No, well, uh, uh, criminal, yes. I, I'm thinking you asked a question about financial earlier, Jerry. And this, it, remember, that's an extraordinary range of decisions. And I don't think we envisage, and it shouldn't be, interventions that would cover everything within a certain territory, even though somebody may be well capable of spending their pocket money or spending small amounts of sums. And on the other hand, you might say that they absolutely would lack capacity to invest in cryptocurrency or something strange like that. So it's considering the individual circumstances at all times and considering the range and complexities of decisions and trying to ensure that people can make the greatest number of decisions for themselves, even if they need support. Okay, thank you. Quiva, um, is there a template being developed by the HSE for professionals to use when undertaking capacity assessments? That's kind of a question for Sean O'Keefe, but anyway, um, uh, yes and no. Uh, so the code of practice, the great code of practice that we're waiting on um, will set out, um, publish them please, um, uh, will set out how it's to be done. So that, that's the first, well actually going back a wee bit, so the national consent policy clearly sets out what a functional assessment of capacity is, so you can go there now. It, and it sets out all of the questions. Um, what the code does is codifies a lot of those questions. Um, what we intend doing, like so if there is still a gap in people's knowledge after the code has been published, then we will produce guidance. But as Sean said, it's not the MMSE. 
It's not who's the president of Ireland. It's, you know, it's those four elements. And also there's a whole screed of questions that you have to go through. There's a whole piece of consent. Um, so it's not quick. And I think that's, that's the thing that people really need to realize. It's not kind of a, a quick thing that you can do in 10 minutes. It's something that's a process because it is a very serious thing to find someone lacks capacity. And, you need, and, and also, I think, you know, all of the evidence heretofore has been that we very quickly trip into lack capacity, therefore can do no decisions thereafter. That's a really serious decision to do. So I think we, you know, there's a whole recalibration of what's the question what's the decision to be made like like that that question from jerry about finances it's not one decision you, you know and any of you that are working with people you know you have to break it down break it down and then enable them to build it up we don't do that naturally and i think that's that's what this act is kind of really challenging us on just on the codes of practice and i know that there is a huge appetite to see those quickly and i hope that we're able to get past the kind of ministerial choreography to get them out there but you won't find surprises in the codes of practice and I hope that's clear from today there is a ton of material there almost perhaps too much there um, that you can be working through at the moment and the act is the foundation document we can't write a code that departs from the act anyway uh, and the codes of practice whilst we've done a fair bit of an edit on them and we've tried to make them as usable as possible are not something you're just going to carry around in a laminate either that tells you how to make every move uh, of necessity they are still in or around the 30 page mark and uh, there are links to vignettes that we hope help and there'll be other associated guidance so um, I feel there's a lot of investment in these codes as if they're going to you know, uh, open the curtains and everybody will suddenly have the perfect understanding they are a kind of a drawing together of material that you can find already anyway and then have that particular status which the act imparts um, so please, yes, do look out for them, but if you're expecting something that just suddenly bottom lines it all for you, prepare to be somewhat disappointed because we can't write that kind of snappy document and retain its technical and legal integrity. Just a reminder, don't do functional assessments of capacity unless you need to, because it is a lot of work. And the other is, it doesn't have to be a rigid series. Of, people look for a template sometimes it's because A, B, C, D, E, it doesn't fall that way. In general, if you're the person who needs a decision to be made and you're dealing with the person you want to put a, a, a tier of support in place and you'll be doing the assessment, you start from the considerable advantage of knowing the person, knowing the situation, the circumstances, and all of that will inform the lines of inquiry which will be specific to that individual. So it simply can't be reduced and shouldn't to a kind of computer-generated question and answers session you know you're dealing with a human being there and the interaction should reflect that so there may be a, a broad criteria or template that you have to deal with all of the four criteria and document them but that doesn't mean the conversation can ever be a reachable thanks thank you okay um thank you very much for your presentation and thank you for raising public awareness of the Act and its implications for families, especially carers, <coughs> and you'd like this question? Well, we have done quite a bit with carers already um, through some of the organising bodies. Um, it's one of the audiences I speak to most frequently and to try to prioritise. I'm aware that there's a lot of reassurance there. I think we do have to be careful, if I may say this kind of gently, with kind of pitting services against carers. It's been my experience. I sometimes feel I've been somewhat parachuted into a room to say, tell those carers what this means which isn't helpful. Uh, and if there's a dynamic there to be resolved, I think that requires attention, which the DSS isn't going to be able to remedy. Um, we have done, as I say, a lot of outreach work. If you look on our website at the moment, uh, we put it out on social media as well. There's a video by me saying, look, families, you're wondering what to expect. And these are some of the things, it's dead short, but it points them to a bundle of other resources. Um, my intention is to record another presentation which will go up on our website which is just like for families and carers so that they know what to expect and what not to read into the act that it does not say at all in some cases I find myself explaining to people I'm not coming after them I don't know who they are and they're only going to have an interaction with the DSS to the extent that they engage formally with the act and sometimes that needs saying um, in a broader sense our public information campaign I hope will help so that will go out on TV and radio um, in the regional and national press so there's a whole comms piece around that that will coincide with commencement as well and it will be an ongoing process I don't mind being asked the same questions over and over again I suspect I'll be answering them until I retire and that's fine 
Um, so our duty to provide information and guidance and to spread reassurance is a continuing one and will take will continue long after commencement. Okay, can I bring maybe um, the advocates' um, perception? I'm going to just maybe come to Anne here at the end. Thanks, Anne. Thank you. Well, I suppose the role of the advocate is to have, you know, support the individual, to have their voice heard. And we encourage families to allow the relevant person to participate in making the decision. And we can only do that by sitting down with them, talking to them, explain the concerns. Uh, I think we've been doing it since 2010, to be quite honest. Um, and we do include families, but we always do explain to them that you don't actually have decision-making power here. This is very much back to the, the client, the resident of the nursing home, wherever that person is. And we'll be talking, I suppose, about most of the relevant person. But the, sometimes I think it's all about misunderstanding. They're, they're wanting to protect that person and they think that by making the decision for them or by keeping information from them that they're actually doing them a great service. And I think, you know, the example that Jerry gave earlier where the clinician made the decision to carry out the procedure without the client's consent, again, it comes back to that thing with the family, the next of kin, the assumption of uh, having the right to make the decision. And I suppose in our line of work, we're sitting down every day with clients in difficult circumstances, if you like, because they're already uh, compromised, maybe, in terms of their ability to make a decision. But we find that with support to make a decision, and only relevant to the decision that has to be made, do I, I want to sell my house? Is it a good idea? What are the implications? We go through all of that. We provide the information. We ask them then to explain back to us what they understand about it. And I always say to them, don't make the decision today. Let's come back to this again. We'll talk about it again and see what is the understanding. Do you fully understand the implications of making that decision? But in SAGE, we say nothing about you without you. So we are forever bringing the client with us. And people say, my mother will not understand. I don't want my mother to know her diagnosis. I don't want her to know that somebody has died in the community. And often, people know, and it worries them a great deal. And a gentleman said to me only recently about a member of his own family where there had been a serious incident and a person died. And he said, I think, Anne, you have a lot more in your head about that than I know. And when he talked about his brother's death, and that was because there was a suicide in the family and that gentleman had not been told. Yet he had full capacity. Yes, he was unwell, he was in hospital, etc. But he kept hearing little, in, little tidbits, if you like, of information that was causing him great concern. So I, I think we'll continue to work in the same principle that we're currently working with. Uh, you are bringing your clients with you. You are talking to them about what it is they want to make a decision about. Can they be supported? And yes, if family want to come in and be a support for that individual. But at the end of the day, we sometimes and quite frequently have to say to families, this is not actually your decision to make. This is your mother's decision or your father. And we are supporting them to make that decision. And that's how we work. Thanks very much, Anne. I'll just pass it over to Bear and Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Apparently this fuzzy thing is also a, a microphone, but we're not sure how, how it works yet. Um, there's, there's loads happening around public awareness, and it, it's amazing because when you've been working on something for, for so long, um, you know, we kind of feel like, oh, sure, everyone's talking about the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act, and then it's like, no, not necessarily. Um, I think it would be ideal if we could clone Sean and, and Anya and Quiva and Jacqueline for going around the country. But in the meantime, there are loads and loads of webinars um, and information online. We held one the other day with mental health reform, specifically around assisted decision making and mental health. And Anya and Jacqueline kindly spoke at that as well. And um, we recorded that. That's going to be going up on our website. Um, and 
you know, there's there's FAQs and, and things like that. We're trying to do some stuff around easy to read. Um, Inclusion Ireland have an event, I think, next week. Sage are doing a brilliant um, list of, of events over the, the, the couple of months around, like, there's the legal profession in, they've the finance groups in you know so trying to kind of hit all of the, the points i know a lot of it happens in dublin so uh, apologies for that for for being uh, you know we're a bit dublin centric sometimes but there is a lot online um and it, it's you know i think it can be a lot today as well um but there, there's there's so much happening online and there's so much kind of there's easy to read versions there's there's a lot of videos for people as well who not just the, the family members or carers for, for people who are concerned about um how they're going to be supported in their decision making um so yeah so good internet connection i think is, is going to be a big thing for the next couple of months what do you know the answer to that? Yeah. um i just i'm looking there at the issue of when discrepancies arise between family wishes and service users wishes and this will be one of the many instances i suppose where the National Advocacy Service would you know, receive a referral or an inquiry. Um, and I suppose oftentimes the independence of our service actually takes the heat out of that discussion. And I suppose I would expect that many such discussions will happen without resource to the DSS. You know, that where issues are broken down, the person's will and preference will be clearly identified. Um, the aspect of the decision that they want to make, maybe something that can be managed, you know, within um, the usual arrangements. Because oftentimes there's, you know, a service user or a person who doesn't want to actually, you know, break their, down their relationships with their family member. Um, but they want to have their voice heard. And I think, I look around the room here and I see so many people that have made those referrals to, to the National Advocacy Service. And in the discussion and in the information gathering and ensuring that you know the person's presumption of capacity is held to the fore and um i suppose just even getting to the nub of what the issue is for the person and um, that that can often be the game changer in the room and i suppose part of our role as well will be obviously supporting the person if there needs to be further information around the different arrangements that they may need to go to but can i just point to something that you know, kind of, yeah, I think it was Sean mentioned about the next of kin. There is an annual review process that happens, you know, when people are in uh, receipt of residential services, and there is um, a piece in that where the next of kin is invited, and it presumes that they, they then presume that they have a decision making agency over the person in the, you know, in the service, and it's changing that mindset. You know that while the person breathes, they are you know the decision maker in the room, and we will support them as best we can to reach the outcome that will improve their quality of life. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Regina. I think the word um, partnership uh, is to the fore in terms of advocacy, family, the person, and the provider. So uh, I'd be working partnership and. In, in the interest of all, so yeah. And recognising the language around next of kin and Absolutely. trying to get, you know, yeah. that, yeah, moved on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I was just going to come in about kind of the information for families and that public awareness piece as well. So all the information we have on our website is open to everybody. It's particularly aimed at staff, but it's done in such a way that it's accessible to everybody. So family members can benefit from watching the webinars or from reading our FAQs because it'll actually help them to understand what the Act's about as well. Um, there's a piece of work that we're doing within HSE Disability Services at the moment where we're undertaking a number of focus groups and I'm seeing people in the room who maybe attended some of them when we were doing them with staff. And one of the outcomes of that is that we're actually going to undertake a focus group specifically with family members as well. We're in the process of planning that at the moment. So it'll be interesting to see what the feedback is from family members in relation to what they need in terms of supports to, to, for the Act. So and we'll be willing to share that information when we get the outcome of that. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thanks, everybody. Okay, we're moving on to our next, <clears throat> I suppose there's three questions which um, relate to consent, I think potentially they're already answered. Um, supporting person around the flu and COVID vaccine uh, and the issue around implied consent or consent of family previously sought. 
if you know the answer to that. Um, Sean, I might just ask you to... Yeah, the, the COVID vaccine was interesting because it kind of gave a bit of a dry run for ADM implementation in that we got a new statutory instrument or a law which introduced concepts of for the benefit and the will and preference. And using that, it was clear again, it went back to the will and preference of the person. And we didn't get over anxious about whether it was their assent or consent or whether it was dissent or refusal of consent. The basic principle was we weren't going to vaccinate people against their will and we were going to vaccinate those who were willing to get it and it was important to say the family didn't have a role directly in providing consent because they can't again that lack the next kin concept they were useful sometimes in supporting people to receive the vaccine that's particularly in people who may be reluctant to so and were anxious about it and families could support them in that way but it was to be clear also that we didn't have vaccination of a very vulnerable group, and particularly the first time round when people were dying in nursing homes, and that places weren't immobilised on the grounds that she's three daughters, two in favour of vaccination, one against, what do we do? It was clear the person would accept the vaccine and that they were willing to receive the vaccine, then the vaccine should be given. And a daughter who disagreed with that was perfectly at liberty to go and seek a court order or something about that, which we know that wouldn't be granted. But we said go ahead and vaccine. So it wasn't family based consent, and that didn't appear in our official documentation. That's true. Um, and I suppose over the years there has been a, an obsession around getting a consent form signed. You know, so once there's a signature on it, it'll be able to go. So my next question requirement for signature uh, to be on a consent form is how do staff document when verbal consent is received, um, and can this be left blank? Yeah, the, the, the signature is only a signature saying a process of communication has occurred. So it's not a kind of a magic wand per se. And we've had, going back to the next kin issue, one of the saddest over the years, have been elderly spouses dragged out of their beds at midnight because they have to sign a form for a loved one who's broken a hip and needs an operation. And that was entirely ludicrous. Whereas the sensible thing there was simply to record that you had appropriately communicated with the husband or wife of the person and explain to them what was going to happen and that they were happy with all this. That wasn't consent, that was simply the humane thing to do, but requiring forms on signatures and obsessing about it never made any sense. And if there are people who have no hands and they can't sign, well then you simply document the discussion you've had with them and that they're in agreement with, the, with a procedure proceeding. But the signature is, is not some sort of magic formula that must be there, and people have obsessed about it unnecessarily. There's a bit maybe, Sean, as well, about local parentis in the emergency situation. And I've seen practice where um, a lady being rushed for an emergency C-section having to sign a consent form on the trolley that should be moved from the labour ward to theatre. So, <laughs> Well, everything is different in the emergency, and I think we have a very useful section in the HSC consent policy about that, and about saying, really importantly, that if treatment is necessary and essential to preserve life or health of people, then go ahead and provide the treatment. It may well be that the person is in no condition to give consent or to receive all of the information you'd normally give, and in those circumstances, you do the least restrictive amount of work, so if there's something immediately needed, uh, to save life and health and it should be done and you shouldn't obsess about forms or calling people or even necessarily about consent if there is doubts about their capacity to give or refuse consent provide treatment that has to be provided and that's we sometimes call the doctrine of necessity is giving the treatment that anybody sensible would want in those circumstances when there's a doubt and you do as little as you can do to get by until you can explore it further and it's the basis for example of why you're able to stitch up the person stoned out of their mind in the A&E who's bleeding and you don't actually we don't call a case conference and agonize about lawyers and consent we go ahead and do it and that's absolutely always been the right thing to do and we'll continue to be the right thing to do under ADM. And this discrepancy arises between family wish and service user wish and um, strong view of some family um, that may have final say that can be pretty much a challenge for frontline staff and quite often will keep Philip and his team busy when it turns into a complaint or whatever. So uh, is there any advice you can give frontline staff in situations where we're dealing with 
family who have strong wills and views over and above the, the needs of the individual? You, you, you treat people very politely, you understand that sometimes they have concerns and you try and listen to them, and sometimes those concerns are well founded, we don't always get it right ourselves, but ultimately this act, and in fact the consent policy previously is all about the service user wish, that they're the person whose wishes holds and while you consider the views expressed by family members, and I appreciate they may be expressed very loudly and vociferously, it's still the service user wishes that must go through, and people mustn't interfere with that. And so I know the practicalities, I work in, in it and in EDs with family members screaming at you, it is the service users. We really must be wishy-washy in those circumstances, and that's nothing to do with ADM, it's just about sheer common sense in doing the right thing for the person. Creva, just the, the, the next question is around sort of family members who have no idea about uh, coming, what's coming into law um, and is it the responsibility of frontline staff to educate them that we will have information booklets and all of that to share but it, it's, it's something that we need to be um, I suppose prepared for and be able to meet that sort of demand which will present day on day? Yeah, so I think it goes back to context. If the person, and I know there's people here that there's people in residential services, if they're in residential services and they're a central part of that person's life, yes. You know, I think that's that's fair. If you don't have that much contact with the family, um, it's not your fundamental duty to educate the family, but if the person is, if their circle of support is their family, then yes, you need to start educating them in some way. Jacqueline already talked about some of the supports that we have, like all of the, as, as Jacqueline said, all of our information has been written in a way that is accessible to everybody. Like some of the codes won't be, but there are some, the, like um, the DSS only could talk about this as well, there is information being developed that's accessible for people, including Ireland have done a good bit of work in terms of trying to make things accessible, so Mental Health Reform, SAGE and NAS as well. Um, but I think this is a process because, you know, you're all here today and like if we did a test of everybody here in terms of what we've covered, I'm sure a lot of you would fail. It's very, it's very complicated. <laughs> and that's no disrespect to your intelligence. It's quite difficult information to, to absorb. So I think that people are going to keep coming asking you exactly the same thing that you, you told them about 20, 50 times. It'll only become relevant when they need it. You know, it's kind of like, you know, the coat hangers in your head. You've got loads of different coats. You use them at different times. You don't use them in the winter, in the summer. This is exactly the same. So I think we just have to be prepared to be asked stuff over and over and over. I'd also love to do a test here of people about GDPR. I bet you'd all fail as well. You only use it when you make a mistake or when somebody else in your service makes a mistake. So it's the same kind of thing. You just have to give yourself a bit of a break, but also remember, you know, like one of the things that's really important, and, and I think some of our panel members have talked about this, is we have to really manage the anxiety of people that this is not about taking people's rights away. It's not at all doing that. And our consent policy has always said very clearly that the voice of the family to give you that context is critical. You don't keep them out. Particularly if they've been central to that person's life, you don't keep them out. So we just have to take a really sensible approach to it. Break down the information and you're the experts in your services in terms of how to take the information we've given you and to try and make... So when I said earlier on, don't take it and, and change it completely, I didn't mean don't make it more simple or don't make it more accessible for the people that you work with and their families. You can do that. You know, we're happy to kind of help you on that. And also the DSS will be doing a lot of that, that you can then take, including Ireland are leading a lot of stuff on that, that you can lift and then and make that your own as well. So, yeah, Sorry, in terms of DSS materials, if people have queries and obviously keep the person at the heart of this as well, of questions about well, what do we do with families, please send the potential beneficiary, the ultimate service user to us as well. Uh, we have the information there and it's our, our statutory function to provide information, guidance about options under the Act. So as Quiva touched on, in addition to the codes, um, there are simultaneously, I hope we're just getting plain English at the moment, um, guides, so as there's a code on how to be a co-decision maker, 
Um, equally or more importantly, there will be a guide on how to make a co-decision making agreement, so dragging the person back to the centre uh, all the time. Um, we are answering questions currently, we get queries that are sometimes not really for us, but we do our best to signpost them, but already people in the DSS are answering the phones uh, about what might what the Act might mean for them and uh, the options that are available. So again, send them, send them our way, we're statutorily obliged to talk to them. So, um, be aware that that resource is there as well and there's really good other work going on in, in expert organisations Inclusion Ireland helped with a focus group that we had looking at our systems and processes and an easy read version of the Act as well. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Anya. The next question, it may already be covered, on yet. Um, for people um, who are water coach, do current support arrangements remain, remain in place until the exit wardship or can we enter new decision support arrangements? Yeah, so uh, if you are a ward of court and have an exit wardship, orders can continue to be made in wardship. Everybody's eligible to come back out of wardship. Um, and they can also look to escalate that process, get themselves further up the queue, um, get their case before the wardship court and uh, come out of wardship and potentially into one of the new support arrangements. Okay. Jacqueline, um, just... What is the point of contact for staff who has concerns or queries regarding ADM? That would be our office. Um, but in the first instance, what I would advise people to do is look at the resources that are already there. Look at the FAQs, look at the webinars, look at the information on the DSS website. And if there's something that you still have a burning issue that's not answered by them, then contact us on the ADM at hse.ie email address and we'll endeavour to answer whatever question query you happen to have. You want to add anything? We've already used Thank you. Okay. Um, where there is doubt regarding a person's capacity and the person is availing of support from H the HSE multidisciplinary team, will an initial capacity assessment be completed by HSE professionals in advance of any application to courts occurring? And if so, um, and, sorry, and if so, is there any uh, implementation plan being looked at uh, which clarifies the roles of the MDT members in relation to the capacity assessment or the process for identifying the professional's best place to complete the capacity assessment? Sean? There's so much buried in there. I, I, I'm just not sure why there's an initial capacity assessment and another one. So you need to clarify why you're doing all of this. This sounds like an awful lot of work. There'd better be a very good reason for heading that direction at all. It, it, there is the, the capacity assessment under the Act is the capacity assessment, which is a formal one as the one where the DSS will have a very helpful code about preparation and conduction of it, and it's also in the consent policy. So it is that. Now, we, I know, of course, that people will have interactions with people before that and may have formed views one way or the other, and that may be the reason why there is consideration of it. But only if you're actually going the route of a formal intervention, like thinking about CDMA or even thinking about a DMRA or to some issue. In terms of MDT, re remember that if you're doing a capacity assessment under the Act, then you're a healthcare professional of the prescribed classes or you're a doctor. So it's not a multidisciplinary assessment. That's not to say that input from different professionals can't be useful in the holistic aspect of care of people, but it is a specific professional taking responsibility themselves for providing information to the person and judging whether they can retain, use and weigh it, etc., and communicate a decision. So it, it, it just to get away from any concept that it's a team effort. That's not to say we do work in teams and uh, in particular, for example, speech and language therapists may be very helpful in facilitating an assessment by improving the way of communicating with it. But that's a different thing from actually performing the assessment yourself. So it is an individual accepting doing, doing it themselves. It will be easier if you're the person who needs the decision made and if your area of expertise is within that decision. But there is certainly nothing that would prevent, for example, a social worker being an assessor for a decision-making intervention for somebody with a healthcare intervention, like an operation. 
it just may be more appropriate sometimes that that's a doctor or indeed the surgeon is going to do the operation. So it's, it's just, uh, it is better if it's your area of expertise and it's easier if it's your area of expertise and it will be an individual though ultimately taking responsibility as assessor. Thanks Sean. Tina or Brennan, anything to add? No, agree with all of that. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose the, the piece though about if there's doubt regarding a person's capacity um, is something that comes up a lot and sometimes it comes up not because there's an issue of making the decision but because we don't like the decision the person is making whether it's I want to stay at home or I don't want to avail of something so um, that's the piece where we need to kind of work with each other and have the conversation about again sitting in that grey space so the person is making a decision we are supposed to be presuming capacity and you're respecting that decision. But if that decision is, well, she wants to be at home, but what if she falls out of the bed? And that's sometimes the conversations we end up getting into. And we found lately that people are saying, do we need to, you know, there's a doubt about, about capacity. And you have to say, well, well, no, there, you know, you have to presume capacity and you need to prove if somebody has an issue with their capacity. But just in terms of, I suppose, the second part of it as well, the implementation plan and any um, uh, resources there, the consent policy kind of steps out the curb assessment and that's available to everybody to go through. And I know various groups around the, the area have been taking the consent policy and dissecting it and, and getting staff kind of trained up in what is a curb assessment or a functional assessment, how do you do that and getting the person to retain. So there's there's loads of resources out there to do that, but the starting point needs to be, um, you know, it, it's not that the person can't make a decision, it's that they're ma they might be making a decision we don't like, so then we have to reassess, do we really need to question their capacity? Yeah, I think we need to be very clear that you're not allowed to just do capacity assessments and not allowed to say to people, you must prove your capacity to be allowed to make a decision. That's not an appropriate starting position ever. So it's very much, there may be certain decisions that seem so extraordinarily unwise and in, in consistent with the person's overall values and beliefs that it may be necessary. But this is not the, the legislation to protect the anxieties of healthcare professionals, basically. So people don't have to prove to have capacity to make decisions for themselves. The onus is very much on the person challenging it, number one. And I think they're the ones where the fact that the person has to consent to an assessment will be extremely useful. Because if you say to somebody, I want to uh, do a capacity assessment, they say, why, what's in it for me? Well, actually, it's for me. It can make me feel more comfortable with your decision. I think if told honestly, people would say, would you get lost now with your own capacity assessment? And don't go there? So I think that it is an important safeguard that people are told why assessments are being performed and have the opportunity to say, no, I'm not satisfied with that as a rationale. That won't help me. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Thanks. Um, okay. Um, is it expected that capacity assessment will be, be deployed as a response to safeguarding concerns identified under the HSC safeguarding policies? For example, if a person's behaviour and decisions are placing them at risk, Will this trigger a capacity assessment? Who will decide who, who completes the capacity assessment, which may be required in circumstances where safeguarding is the primary concern? Tina. See the answer above. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a similar situation. Um, the safeguarding policy, though, is there as well to be followed, um, and it's very clear as to what you do if you identify a concern about somebody. Um, and there's no part of the safeguarding policy that says go and do a capacity assessment on this person. So follow the protocol and the, and the procedures in terms of a safeguarding concern. Um, and I would think that it's it's you know the same as before, presumed capacity, um, and that should be your starting point. Brendan, I don't know if you. Again, it's all about the capacity building, isn't it? And making giving the person as much information as possible in relation to making the choice about that unwise decision. I think we need to move away from this. We're quite risk adverse sometimes. We want to make sure we're protecting ourselves and the organisation and so on. Not necessarily sort of supporting the person and allowing them to make the unwise choice and the decision which may not prove of ourselves. So I think the most of it is giving them the information, you know, advising them of the consequence of the decision making and also 
the implications for them as an individual, recognizing their individual rights and promoting those accordingly. And I think the principles of consent is about Absolutely. giving the information so that it's an informed mm -hmm. decision. Yeah. It, it, just to say this act gives healthcare professionals no new powers. So it's not until suddenly you do these things and now you have a great deal of powers to impose your preferences on people. That's not the case. And very much those cases always go back to the deprivation of liberty issue, which I don't think we can deal with today because it is a different issue. But if you're serious about actually trying to put somebody into a home against their wishes, then quite correctly has to go through a very arduous and formal process, which is outside the ADM. I thought we were going to mention that today. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, our next question again is a more important question, um, and again, so we have already covered it. But under the Ward of Court arrangements, all capacity assessments required for court applications have been carried out by privately practicing professionals, usually consultant psychiatrists, and, us and usually arrangements for the assessments are made by the HSC solicitors. The decision for the Ward of Court application to be made by HSE is usually made at management level, i.e. head of service, who then instructs the HSE solicitors to lodge a ward of court application. <coughs> Under new ADM procedures, will there be any change to how the capacity assessments are carried out during the HSE-led applications for decision support? Has any work been completed on the application plan? Uh, sorry, on the implementation plan for agency in relation to this. Quiva. That's a big question, and, and the only thing between us and lunch is that question, I would say. Um, um, uh, yes, it will change. Yeah, I mean, the, the, well, well, in terms of the process, I mean, that process of having to go through senior management to be able to, you know, for a decision making representative, that will still have to stand. And the same, some, you know, the same internal processes will have to stand in terms of. The, what's going to be required that will change because it's now under the, you know it'll, it'll be under the, this act so um and the detail only might talk a little bit about this the, the detail of what's going to be required for the court hasn't been published yet um uh, so traditionally it's been doctors who've done those assessments and it's, it's a person is of, of unsound mind and unable to manage their affairs that will be gone um, we do know that um, it's not going to be just doctors for the decision-making representative, representative order. It'll be a doctor or a healthcare professional as prescribed. So nurses, nurses, midwives, um, speech and language therapy, physio, sorry, nurses, midwives, speech and language therapy, uh, psychologists, okay. occupational therapists and social workers. They're the prescribed classes as well as registered medical practitioners. Um, Psychologists once they're regulated. Um, well, I'm not sure about that, so we'll come back to that one. Yeah, let's keep away from that one. Sorry, 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 in the last moments that we have, that's different from those assessments for the co-decision making agreement and the EPA. That's not court appointed, this is court appointed. So the other thing just to say as well is that where a person qualifies for legal aid, they will, they, they will be entitled to legal aid because it's a legal process. They need these reports for that legal process, so they will have legal aid. Um, for the, to be able to get those assessments. Those assessments, again, will be done privately, so obviously that's, that's an issue. Um, whereas, uh, Sean already said it all, earlier on, the assessments for the co-decision making agreement and the EBAs, the HSC have agreed that that is something that can be facilitated. Because, well, particularly the co-decision maker, because that person will be known to us. And, and, the, and the intention is, if it's somebody that I'm supporting, let's say I have a, I'm in a community mental health team and I'm supporting that person, I am the best person probably to do that assessment because the whole idea of a co-decision making agreement is it, you're assessed by someone that really knows you rather than somebody that's helicoptered in to make a decision about something that they don't know anything about you. So, um, anyway, thank you. Just conscious of time, yeah. Jerry, um, yeah, just to be able to get another couple of minutes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you want to add anything? Oh, only to say that the, the court process belongs to the court's service, and we can link people through to information about the court process when it becomes available. 
court rules will determine that there be a specific form for applying to court, a specific form of supporting documentation needs to go with that application, and we expect all of that to be available quite soon. Uh, in relation to costs, as Quiva has touched on, legally it will be available to the applicant subject to a means test, which is a little bit mean in my view, but um, uh, and also available to the relevant person because they're at the heart of all of this and important decisions are being made about them. Uh, the whole act is amenable to legal aid as well so that people should be able to take themselves now waiting lists, access to law centres, all of that. Um, but the whole act actually is amenable to legal aid and people would be able to um, call that in aid and um, to apply to the decision support service for people are doing that for some of the other arrangements we can waive fees as well there are smallish fees that go with registering but we're in a position to waive those that's provided for under the act as well there's several more questions here people uh, just, just want to be there on time for me can we give five minutes to the floor if anybody has got any Questions over involved. Anyone wants to answer one then? No, yeah. So what what I'm gonna propose is that the questions that the questions that are here we'll answer we'll do a like a own answer sheet that that will be made available to everybody yes. just because I know there's some of these yeah. are burning questions for people. We do that all the time anyway yeah. with our yeah. webinars yeah. and this follow-up. Yeah. So sure. we can do that. Appreciate that. Thanks yeah. very much. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have a reduce the mic maybe. Yeah. Don't need the mic. Just okay. Where they exist already, where people have already made them, is that correct? Yeah, or, or where they're going to make them, does it make it um, any more complicated, any, anything? I shouldn't think so. What, what happens is, or will happen, is that they now have a statutory basis. I think it's opportune now that the Act is coming in and advanced healthcare directors are being put in a statutory basis be able to look at the ones that they've already made and satisfy themselves that they meet the requirements of the Act, which aren't, in fact, particularly demanding in terms of and them being signed and witnessed and so on. But it's always, I think, a good idea to keep one's AHD under review to ensure that it meets your current health situation and how you really feel about things. But I think, as, as Sean mentioned, AHDs have been recognised for quite a while now and here they will have a statutory basis. Okay. Just a quick question on the intersection between AHDs and the Health Act. I'm going to take quite a few queries on the phone from family members who are having difficulty accessing information from services about the person and the defense is normally because through GDPR they can't consent and then there's kind of like a catch for two that happens so well, the person doesn't have the capacity to consent so you can't just have access to the information. So will the assistant under this, the registered assistant or co-decision maker have authority to get information that mm -hmm. belongs to They specifically do, that's part of their legal role, to be involved in the sharing of information, access and explaining the information which is covered by the particular arrangement that they've entered, entered into, it's not a free-for-all. But again, the presumption of capacity and the will and preferences of the person should help. We mustn't assume that uh, I wouldn't want service providers, banks, third parties, whoever they are, to suddenly go, ah, but you should really be a DMA in order to be sharing this conversation. If I can bring somebody into a room and say I want them here, then um, it's tenable for any person enjoy with the benefit of the presumption of capacity and giving expression to what they want, similarly to have their supporter there without the need for formality necessarily. Yeah. Yes, a simple question. If I want to vaccinate a child with special needs, child? Child. a child, child with special needs, child. and the child said no, what shall I do? <laughs> Great, I'm a geriatrician by the way. <laughs> what I'm going to say is, is children are not covered by ADM. It makes, this is all about adults, so it, it's, it's an entirely different. So a, ch a child and the lawyers will know better about the rights of parents in those circumstances. But what, what was happening generally, the child is saying, no, you're not going to cause distress to a child. Now, there may be infants who are so small that there, there is the issue of clinical holding sometimes arises, uh, but it would be talk to the parents, figure out how best to communicate with the child to try and persuade them if that's essential for that child, but not covered by ADM at all. Good question. Okay, any more questions? Okay, um, if uh, you will in preference, if somebody wants to say stay at home uh, and not go into residential care, and there's a limit on the service that we're able to provide, 
Oh, well, first of all, this doesn't impose any new obligation on the HSE to provide supports where they're not available or can't be provided, while accepting that sometimes they should be there and aren't there. But if people are entitled, the bottom line is that people's will and preference is taking into account the options that are actually on the table. So they won't be taking into account the options that in some sort of ideal world the HSE might have in Ross Muck or Connemara or someplace. It's going to be the actual resources on the ground. But on that basis, they're entitled to say, look, with those resources are inadequate, but I still want to stay at home. Good luck to them. And, and who's responsible then? For, for what? For now, if, it, if it is an unsafe, if that person is so dependent, and they're, they're, they're really I'm not going to a nursing home, right, and say that we have a limit of, uh, just to give an example, 50 hours home care for Sure. No, it is. And it's gone, it's yeah. gone beyond that, and then they still say no. So what happens? Well, they're my favourite patients. Uh, they have the great will to be at home yeah. that says, I'm staying at home no matter what. Okay. And that includes blackmailing the HSE to say, I'll haunt you in your dreams if you fail to give me some hours out of that home health application. But essentially, it's up to them to decide whether or not it's worth, worth the candle to stay at home in those circumstances. And good luck to them again. And uh, they've made their choices. They may have to live with the consequences of those choices if they're poor. Uh, and it's cause of concern and worry, and people do blackmail the home health organiser and their family to provide support, and that's part of human nature. But but no, there's nothing in the act that's going to allow you to piss them away or or help. Uh, the, yeah. Quite the opposite. Yeah, they make. Can they legally challenge us if we're not able to provide? It, well, not by, not by this act. No, there's no there's no extra resources for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Comes with here. So you do your best, and they make their choices based on the best that can be provided. Would you be identified under the Act if the person without a bed and night? Well, the Act has nothing to do with it, first of all. That's always been the case, that, and I've been there many times, I'm afraid to say, is that there's a poor outcome in somebody's at home, and somebody's upset about it, and I have a difficult inquest, and I'd rather not have a difficult inquest, and I'd rather not be in the Connacht Tribune again. But it, <laughs> but it happens. But I've never had to worry about indemnity. I'm doing my health care covered by the State Claims Agency, for example. I'm, I'm doing my best in the circumstances and giving limited resources, and the outcome has been poor, and that's unfortunate. But... Uh, you know, I've done my best. Unless you're, you, you like plotted to allow them to die because you're deeply evil, I wouldn't. Try to <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a negligence yeah. issue rather than yeah. ADM. Yeah. 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 Okay, I'll take one more question if there is, and if not, we will conclude. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just ask about the engagement with the regulatory bodies um, in terms of? I suppose the implications of ADM um, in relation to regulatory standards, because I think that's a particular anxiety point, um, you know, for staff and I suppose just supporting people then in the context of the uh, the act coming um, are coming into force. And so it's would be interesting to hear that because I think it's very relevant to the frontline experience. <coughs> Um, so obviously HICWA is a big one, um, so HICWA have confirmed, because there has been some rumour that HICWA are going to be doing own inspections on under the Act, they're not, not immediately certainly and not in the next year because that takes a while for that to be done. HICWA's regulations itself and any of you that are in disability services and in older person services, they're not in sync with the Act. So they will need to be amended. So that's their priority in the first instance to get their regs sorted out. Um, we, we, we're in regular contact with a number of the inspectors and we've, we've spoken to them um, like and, and they've kind of and they've worked with us, like we do a lot of webinars with them as well. So they're they're kind of their their attitude is get people you know, there's a lot of resources developed, now people need to get get into those resources, get familiar with those resources get our consent processes properly aligned with what's been in place for quite a number of years. That's their priority first. Um, they won't be, like obviously until their, their regs are changed, they can't inspect on these things. But there are, there are other things that, that <laughs> um, well, yeah, I think that's cute to call. Um, uh, in terms of the other regulators, so the professional regulators, we, we have engaged, or have separately engaged with them. 
they have a duty to engage with the act. So um, any of you that are in NMBI will see, you know, that actually if you look at the policies and their ethical guidelines, they have aligned themselves and they did that about a year and a half ago. So they already speak to the provisions of the act and have done that for some time. Kuru are a little bit behind. They're not, they're not necessarily on, but there are principles that will align with the act. Um, uh, the medical council guidelines, I think, were updated, not fully, but I think they might still have best interest. That'll have to be amended as well. Um, we do engage with them. Uh, we, we engage with all of the regulators on all, like on various dis different parts. So obviously, to do with the assessments of capacity, we needed to talk to the regulators to see about scope and practice. Was it within scope and practice? All of the regulators have said, particularly for those named prescribed classes, yes, it absolutely is in their scope and practice. But it's still up to the individual practitioner to decide whether they engage in it or not. And that's why the HSC have taken a position that it's not a must. You don't have to do this. You can opt into doing it, and that's too. And also, part of that is, I mean, there's there's different positions on that. Some people think no, it should be a must. And um, we felt that people are so overwhelmed and they're so exhausted from the whole go. So just let's work our way into it and see how we go. See how the next year goes in terms of how that's going to work because it's an unknown. We've never done co-decision making agreements before. So okay, okay, just conscious of time. So um, yeah. thanks for your questions. Uh, as Queen says, we'll get answers to questions, many of them uh, that were submitted, so thanks for that. We do have another 10 minutes yep. uh, before lunch, so please bear with us, I think. Have we got that? Well, so, well, we're good. We can you use it. <laughs> Okay. So we were going to show you a short video, but I think kind of in the interest of time and rumbling stomachs, we might issue the video out by email. You can watch it in your own in your own time. Just to say that the video was produced when we launched the book that Quiver was talking about. So it's um, a number of advocates, including a local from Tubber Curry, um, Helen Rushford Brennan, yeah. talking about why the act is important for me and what the act means for me. Um, so watch it at your leisure. We will send you the link. Um, however, I'm going to hand over to Burr, who's going to talk to you for a few minutes about why that's important. This is why I drove up from Dublin. Can I stand up? Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, can, I put it? can people hear me about that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, I'm going to stand up and walk around a little bit. Um, and I'm not going to keep this for 10 minutes because I know everyone's starving and you've had a really, really full on morning. Can people hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, I was jealous of Jerry having his podium standing up over there. So I <laughs> want to do this like standing and, and, and seeing everybody. Um, so what I want to do first, I was thinking about this on the drive this morning while I was questioning the decision making of some of the other drivers on the road. Um, <laughs> But just for a second, right, trust me on this, and I know some of you know me and, and some of you don't, so trust me, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do anything uh, too out there. Just take a second and close your eyes, right, and this is for you as well. T close your eyes and think about, are there any decisions that you have made over your life that you think, oh God, that was an unwise decision? <laughs> and nobody has to disclose anything, no one has to share anything right now. And then just think as well for a second, for your loved ones, sons, daughters, family members, partners, whatever it is, are there any decisions that they made and make or are about to make or are making and you think, oh my God, like, you know, I just want, that's not what I would do. This is not what I think they should do. And then sometimes in the past, they might've done it anyway and it has turned out really, really well. So I just want to bring it back to that thing of all of us, will be impacted by the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act because all of us are going to have decisions either in our own lives or in our family members and community neighbours lives. Sorry, you can open your eyes again if you want to. <laughs> don't fall asleep on me, don't fall. So I think for me that's it's such a big thing that when there's, you know, I know there's, it's so legalistic and there's so many things and there's so many considerations about, you know, if someone falls out of the bed and the repercussions and things that can happen. But to constantly bring it back to, okay, if this was me, if my decision-making power was taken away from me, if people were making decisions on my behalf, what would I, what conversations would I want to have? How would I want to be included? Some people, their family, friends, carers and supporters are great. For some people, their family members are, are not great supports. And you know their their wishes can override the, the the person. So it's really it's taking the time to build the relationship, to you know the, the the thing of that not every decision is going to mean that that person 
lacks capacity for some other decision. It's the constant conversations. It's just really about, and, and the other thing as well is, you're all working in this area because you care about people. You know, none of us are in this for the money. You know, as I was saying to Sean earlier, he's like the Bono of, of ADM, <laughs> yeah, and stopped walking around Galway and stuff. But, so, you know. We're going to put that on the next book. Um, <laughs> But it's it's really it's it's I'm so and I and I think I I think people sometimes think I'm naive and all of that kind of stuff. I prefer to stay optimistic and positive because otherwise we wouldn't get out of bed in the mornings. But the opportunity that you all have and that we all have to empower people, people who've been left for years and years and years having decisions made for them, people who don't have capacity to make decisions because they've never had an opportunity to make a decision. And you get to start building that capacity and the work that Inclusion are doing, SAGE, National Advocacy Service, so many um, community and voluntary sector organisations around, so many disabled person organisations. There's loads of us out there as well, outside of the HSE, who are more than willing to talk to, to you all, to share resources, to signpost, to put you in contact with people with lived experience, who are, have been empowered by the professionals and the people in their lives who have given them the time to support them in decision making. Um, and just again, I know I can, I can go on, so I'm going to be really quiet. Um, the, for, for mental health um, side of things, I've spoken to so many people with lived experience who, who've had experiences of psychosis. And when they're well, they'll say to me, they're like, it's so, so scary <coughs> for them. Of course it is. The things that, that are happening for them and they're feeling, it's, it's so, so scary. And when they're out of that and when they're well and when they're doing well in recovery, they can say, well, actually, yeah, I did need those meds or, you know, I'm glad that my family um, talked to that person or, or whatever. And that's where advanced healthcare directives come into it. And it's delighted that, that you mentioned that. Um, so it's really how scary it is for, for anyone who is having their, their capacity questioned and, and putting yourself in, in that place. Um, I did bring some like prezies for you as well that I left out on the tables outside. Uh, I didn't have one for everyone in the audience because there's so many of you. Um, but uh, so some of our resources are out there and I'm B Grogan at mentalhealthreform.ie. Happy to, to send on anything that, that I can that might be of use. Um, and just to say, uh, if I was tested this morning on, on assisted decision making, I'd still fail because it's so, so intricate. And when I worked in the Dáil, like, this is one of the most intricate, difficult pieces of legislation I've, I've ever come across over the years. Like, so it's really just be patient with yourselves and with the people who, who are asking questions. And I really have to say, like Jacqueline and Quiva, Anya, Sean, I, I'm sure the others are all lovely as well, but I've, I've, <laughs> I've been at so many meetings with them and so many steering group meetings, and there's so much work being done at a HSE le level to try and make sure staff are supported, getting the information that you need to, to really get this opportunity to, like, when do you get to say, like, well, I'm actually, you know, promoting people's human rights today. I'm, you know, I've built this capacity with a person around their decision making. So... Excitement is, because they're probably wrecked after the day, but I'm hoping that you'll leave with a, with a bit of excitement and, and a bit of optimism about what's coming down the line. Thank you. speakers. I want to particularly thank our advocates for being here and working with us. Um, I want to thank you for making the journey here today in, in what was very difficult terrain to travel and I really wish you a safe journey home. I also want to thank, uh, thank our comms colleagues for organising our gentleman in the corner here that has been doing all the work from early this morning setting up and really appreciate your support in that. I want to thank my own team for organising today. Uh, I want to particularly thank Quiva and her team uh, for all of the support to today, up to today and beyond. And we will be leaning on you uh, and your office uh, quite frequently. Uh, we have um, established uh, an implementation group in CHO1. Um, we are agree in terms of reference and getting it up and running. So it's, a, it's at an early stage. I think it's very timely. Um, so 
the act coming in on the 26th of April doesn't mean to say that the 27th of April will, will be something different. Mm -hmm. uh, it will have a challenge. It will take time. Um, and thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you.